So this is a slide I stole from a friend and it's obviously meant to make a joke because that isn't quite what we looked like. But if you look at the person on the extreme right, that's how we meant to look like. And as I said in 1966, when I matriculated, everyone looked like that. And then something changed. And the reason, but the reason why that guy looks like that and is lean and athletic is because the regulator in his brain that controls his body weight is working perfectly. And that's called an apostat. And I'll talk at length about the apostat. So humans are designed to be controlled by these homeostats, which keep everything absolutely in control. And weight is one of them. But what happened, unfortunately, was that the food environment changed dramatically after 1977 as a result of the dietary guidelines. And what happened was the apostat got hijacked. And it got hijacked by those foods, the high, high refined carbohydrate, high sugar foods, that caused the problem. So the guy on the right is now quite obese. His problem is that his body doesn't recognize he's got all this excess energy. In contrast, he's perpetually hungry. And that tells us that there's something wrong. It's not recognizing. The apostat is not recognizing that he already has a surfeit of energy, which he could use, but he can't access it. And I'm going to try to explain to you why he can't access that energy and why the apostat has been hijacked. So the key to understanding is that we're told that calories out and calories in must be balanced. And of course that's true. If you want to maintain body weight, you must only eat exactly the number of calories you need to sustain your energy. But the brain controls your calories out and the brain controls your calories in. And the, the linkage is the thing called the apostat. So let's look what happens if the part of the brain tells you you want to do more exercise, what happens, or less exercise, what happens to the part of the brain regulating how much you're going to eat? And that's the apostat function. So if you become less physically active, this is cru crucial, you don't become fat if the system is working. And we're going to hear a lot of argument that oh, obesity is caused by lack of physical activity. That's nonsense. Because this is a homeostatically regulated system. And if the homeostat's working, it doesn't matter if you do more or less exercise, you shouldn't put on weight or you shouldn't lose weight. So in a perfectly regulated system, reducing your physical activity makes you eat less. So that's crucial. You don't get fat because you did less physical activity today. In a properly regulated system, you simply eat less. So if the brain homeostats are working appropriately, humans who exercise less cannot become fat, they'll simply eat less. And that's how we were for millions of years. No one knew about calories and all those things. But we were lean without having that knowledge. Now, if you increase your physical activity, you don't necessarily lose weight. You might lose a little bit in the short term, but in the long term, you don't. Because you just eat more. Your energy intake goes up because that's how homeostats work. So if the brain homeostats working appropriately, humans who exercise more do not lose weight. They just simply eat more. Now the problem is if you increase your energy intake, the apostat doesn't know what to do with it because it can't make you become more physically active because there's no effect. So the homeostat fails when the calorie consumption is excessive. It doesn't force you to go exercise more. In fact, what happens with time and increased body fat stores that we call gluttony, you become slothful. So as you eat more and you put on more weight, the apostat's does the apostate or the part of the brain controlling physical activity doesn't correct. In fact, it does the opposite. And we know this, that children who get fat don't stop become physically act first physically inactive. They become fat and then they become physically inactive. And that is documented. So this is a reverse causation. The apostate malfunctions, you become fat and then you become less and less active. And we use that in our management of obesity, in that we get people to lose the weight first and then tell them to exercise. So, I'm not a brain expert, but how do I know, how did I work this out? Because it is so obvious. And the answer is that I understand homeostats. And I developed the most comprehensive model of how the brain works during exercise.
my point here is this is the model we developed over a period of 20 years of how the brain regulates exercise performance. I'm not going to go through it just to say that the, when I started in the exercise sciences, the brain was considered irrelevant to exercise performance for some reason. And we realized that the brain is the complete regulator of performance. And it doesn't matter how it works, but this is the model. But my point is that this again is a homeostat. And people had excluded the homeostat from understanding exercise performance. And what they were teaching, what we were teaching until we realized it was wrong, was that when you exercise, the system breaks down and you collapse. And that's not true. That never happens. The brain anticipates the future and regulates your performance. So that when you run the Comrades Marathon, if you're properly trained like the, the champions, you finish and you're not completely exhausted. And that's because the brain has anticipated, knows today I'm going to run 90 kilometers. So it paces you from the first, pay, first pace so that you get to the finish. It was something I always, I could never understand how can a comrade runner who's never run the distance run the last kilometer faster than the first kilometer? How does his brain know? And eventually we worked it out. So the point being here is that the brain is the key homeostat that works to keep us alive. And in obesity, it's the problem. Obesity is a brain disorder because the apostat, apostat fails. So this is the model that we teach. And the model is the energy imbalance model of obesity. In other words, you take in too many calories, you don't expend enough, and so the excess is simply converted and stored as fat. And the key problem with this model is that the, it doesn't include the brain. It's a brainless model. And the humans don't function without the brain. We always have the brain. And my argument is the failure of apostat, the failure of the apostat function that causes obesity. The problem with this model, it explains how we get fat, but it doesn't tell us about the why. It's like telling an alcoholic that you drink too much alcohol. Actually, he doesn't need to know that. He knows that. The question is, why do you drink too much alcohol? And that's what the science question is. And I'm a scientist, and I want to know that answer. So why do the obese ingest too many calories? And I hinted at it the, in the previous part. Uh, talk and the answer is the obese ingest too many calories because they're always hungry and that's the characteristic of obesity is that people are always hungry and so it's my opinion that abnormal apostat function is the first requirement for the development of obesity and the metabolic syndrome and perhaps type 2 diabetes because you get abnormal apostat function and then the developments of, of type 2 diabetes and it is associated with insulin resistance, perhaps as the underlying driver. So there is another component that I haven't yet completely worked out where insulin resistance fits into regulating body mass. It's more complex. But what insulin resistance does is cause you to become very sick, whether you're obese or whether you're lean, and ingesting a high carbohydrate diet. So it's a slightly different com component. So we've got the abnormal apostat function, which is driving obesity, and then we've got insulin resistance, which is making you really sick. And you can be insulin resistant without being fat. So the apostat might be working properly, but you're still dying because you're insulin resistant eating a high carbohydrate diet. So I try to differentiate the two. It's a little complex. We haven't worked out the full story as yet. And so this just describes the current model that we have. We take in too many calories. We're gluttonous. We tend to spend too much energy, too little energy, and become slothful. And so we become a beast. And you know why we use this model? We use this model because we don't know the cause of obesity and therefore we can't blame ourselves. We've got to blame the patient. And so that's easy. The doctors can't be wrong. The patient's wrong. And what we do is we make the patient carry the burden of our ignorance. And the reason why our book Real Meal Revolution was so successful was because we said, you're not the problem. The patient is not the problem. The only thing you're doing is you're making bad food choices. And if you just fix up your food choices, you'll prove, you'll, you'll improve, and you'll prove that you're not gluttonous and you're not slothful. And so we have people who are labeled gluttonous and slothful, who within months become incredibly lean without changing their personality. All they did was change the food they ate. Simple. And I came across this quote recently, eating on the base of calorie counts, which is the conventional way we tell people to lose weight, is exactly as useful as judging writing based, in, based on word count. It's not the way you judge the efficacy of an intervention. <laughs>
So what really happens in obesity, in the model we propose, and this is the insulin fat storage model of obesity, which is that excessive dietary carbohydrate intake worsens insulin resistance and also activates the apostat. And we'll come to how it worsens insulin resistance and that leads to obesity. And as a consequence, as you become more obese, you become more gluttonous and more slothful. And that is reverse causation. It's the obesity causing the gluttony and the sloth, not the other way around. So that's the model. And in the next slide, we're going to start talking about the insulin model of obesity in more, in more detail. So the insulin model of obesity begins with the understanding that in the bloodstream, we only have a tiny amount of glucose. And a great emphasis was made on how important glucose is to our survival and so on. Well, it's really interesting that we contain so little glucose in the bloodstream. If glucose is such a crucial component for our health, why do we have so little of it in the bloodstream? Admit we have 300, 400, 500 grams of carbohydrates stored in muscle, but that might just be a surplus store. But the reality is to keep the brain going, God or whomever decided that you just need five little grams of glucose in the bloodstream. That's all. Now what happens to us and what's happened since 1977 is we've got this surplus of carbohydrate that we eat repeatedly. Every few hours the body is exposed to the surplus of carbohydrate. So for those of you who had biscuits a few minutes ago, this is what's happening. You've just eaten 25 to 50 grams of carbohydrate. Now that carbohydrate has got to be stored but it's going into a tiny little compartment which has only five grams. And the 50 grams now suddenly has to stuff itself into that little compartment. And we've le the human has evolved to get rid of the carbohydrate as quickly as possible because it's toxic. High, high glucose levels are toxic. So what the body does is it increases, allows the blood glucose to rise a little bit and then it excretes insulin from the pancreas. And so after the meal, within the first 15 minutes or so, what happens in your body is that you have circulating now lots of glucose and lots of insulin. And it's that combination which now is going to drive the storage of that carbohydrate throughout the body. And the first site that is impinged is the liver. And the liver is going to take up that carbohydrate and store it some as glucose or glycogen, and, but most of it is going to be converted to fat. And particularly if you had sugar in your tea, sugar contains fructose and the only thing that fructose can be converted is to triglyceride in the liver. That's it. And we're going to talk at length about what happens when you develop triglyceride excess in the liver. So the fructose from your sucrose is converted to triglycerides in the liver and the rest, the liver starts to convert that carbohydrate into fat and exports the fat to the fat cells where they're going to store the excess carbohydrate that can't be immediately stored in the liver or in the muscles because there's a small, there's small capacity. So that fat storage occurs because of the hormone insulin. And insulin is the fat building hormone. It's critically important to understand that because we hear a lot of people talk about obesity. And if they don't measure insulin, mention insulin as the first hormone of importance, they're missing the point. So insulin drives the fat into the fat cells, but it, it's worse because it also prevents the fat from being used. So whenever your fat cells, your carbohydrates, sorry, whenever your insulin levels are high, you prevent the fat from being used as a fuel and you just burn the carbohydrate that you've recently eaten. So anyone who had carbohydrate for tea is now becoming a carbohydrate burner. Those of us who are fat adapted, we burn fat the whole day. And so we're just taking fat in, storing it in fat cells and burning it. And that's the fat burning cycle. If you're a carbohydrate burner, you take the carbohydrates, you try to store it, and you will then burn the excess. And that's what you burn all day. So you're always storing the carbohydrates and burning the carbohydrates. You never get to burn the fat that's sitting in the fat stores. To do that, you have to get the insulin down. 
But carbohydrates have another effect. That hunger, as I've indicated, is stimulated by fructose and other carbohydrates. And the, the body tries to prevent or reverse that by releasing a hormone called leptin from fat cells. So as the fat cells become more and more stored with fat, they release leptin. And leptin is meant to cause satiety and make you stop wanting to eat. So leptin is the satiety hormone. But the problem is, as one becomes fatter and more insulin resistant, the insulin inhibits the satiety signaling by leptin. Now, it's much more complex than this, and I don't pretend to understand it. But that's what we call leptin resistance as a cause of failure of satiation after eating meals. So here you can see insulin is already causing a couple of problems. It's causing the body to store fat, and it's store, causing you not to be satiated by the carbohydrates. And I've indicated to you how people who eat more carbohydrates, or the populations who eat more carbohydrates, become fatter. But that's only the beginning of the problem because insulin is a highly toxic substance. And I'll give you that later. But immediately what I want to tell you is that insulin increases insulin resistance. So the disease I'm going to talk about, insulin resistance, is made worse. Every time you secrete insulin, you become marginally more insulin resistant. How do we know this? Because if we put patients on experiments on insulin, within a week of giving insulin regularly, they become more insulin resistant. So, insulin resistance increases liver and pancreatic insulin resistance, which now worsens as the liver becomes more and more fatter, and we call that condition non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I'm going to show you in the last month, we have, under, we have advanced our understanding of the key role of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in arterial disease. It turns out this is going to be crucial. So, what's happening in the liver is depending on arterial health of our arteries. So as you take more insulin and secrete more insulin, you become increasingly more insulin resistant, both in the liver, in the pancreas, and in the periphery. So what that means is you need to secrete more and more insulin to get rid of the carbohydrates that you're taking in your diet. And as you secrete more insulin, there are a whole array of other causes, problems that we will explain later. So there, so the dietary carbohydrate Sorry, the dietary carbohydrate causes increased insulin resistance, it causes obesity, and it causes prevention of satiety. And that's the cycle of obesity, how obesity develops. And so that's a simple mechanism to explain obesity. So my argument is obesity is not a difficult concept to understand. The physiology is simple. It's, that's a simple explanation, and one could put, amplify it. But if you start with that basis, you start to understand how, what we have to do to prevent obesity. So the point I was making was that all medical students are taught this in second year medical student studies because this is the standard textbook that is given to us. It will become apparent that insulin secretion is associated with energy, and abund energy abundance. That is, where there is great abundance of energy giving foods in the diet, especially excess amounts of carbohydrates, I emphasize, especially excess amounts of carbohydrates, Insulin is secreted in great quantities. In turn, the insulin plays an important role in storing the excess energy. In the case of carbohydrates, it causes them to be stored as glycogen, mainly in the liver and the muscles, as I indicated. But also, all the excess carbohydrates that cannot be stored as glycogen are converted under the stimulus of insulin into fats and stored in the adipose tissue. And the key point is that in insulin resistance, the body is resistant to storing the carbohydrate, apologize for that, the the, the body is resistant to storing the excess carbohydrate as liver or muscle glycogen. And that's another characteristic of diabetes. We have a reduced capacity to take the glucose from the bloodstream and store it in the muscles or in the liver. Which means we have to convert more of the carbohydrates into fat. And, and now we come to the, the most interesting slide, or one of the most important interesting slides. And, and this is how I see the whole story and how we need to sort the problem out. And it is unconventional, but I will argue it is true. And I will argue that there are many reasons why people can't see what to me is abundantly clear. So, 
It is my argument that in current medical practice, we see what sits above the surface and we ignore what is sitting below the surface. And I will explain what's above the surface and what's below the surface. So what is above the surface are the chronic diseases of our times, which, as I argue, have increased dramatically in the last 50 to 100 years. And the first such disease is arterial disease. And I've changed this slide from what was previously given to you. I've made a slight change, but it shows how my thinking has changed since the last two or three weeks. And I'll explain why that is. So the biggest problem we face in the world today is in, in terms of chronic disease is arterial disease. And arterial disease can be classified as the disseminated form, which is type 2 diabetes, and that is the characteristic of diabetes. We define diabetes as glucose and insulin malregulation, but it's not that. It's a, it's a disseminated arterial disease in which the arteries become progressively obstructed until there's no blood flow. And when that happens, you lose limbs, you lose your kidney function, you lose your eyesight. And that, I will argue, is because of this continual production of insulin that damages the arteries and causes this progressive obstruction. If it affects only the heart, then we call that cardiovascular disease. If it affects the, the blood vessels, we call that cerebrovascular disease. And I would like to argue that when we talk that cardiovascular disease is being prevented and so on, and and the incidence is going down, it's simply because people are moving from one category to the other, one category of arterial disease to another. They're going from cardiovascular disease to disseminated type 2 diabetes. So that's the one form. Then obesity, hypertension, gout. And then what we consider atherogenic dyslipidemia, which is the abnormal concentration of blood lipids. Notice it doesn't say cholesterol, it's dyslipidemia, and dyslipidemia is abnormalities in lipoproteins. And I mentioned that yesterday. Cholesterol is not carried in the blood as cholesterol, but as lipoproteins. And that is a protein carrier which allows different type concentrations of cholesterol and other constituents to be con travel around the body. And it's only some of those lipoproteins that are toxic to the blood vessels. And I'm just going to take a step backwards because in 1967, Dr. Gorfman in the United States of America was the first to show that lipoproteins predict heart attack risk. And he said it's not cholesterol, it's the lipoprotein distribution. And he was ignored. Why was he ignored? Because he was the only person in America, there were four other people, there were five people who could measure lipoproteins. And so they said, well, if we're going to prevent heart disease, we have to make it a simple explanation. We can't study lipoproteins. It's too expensive. And they simplified it into cholesterol. And so they simplified the model so badly that we began to believe cholesterol was the thing that could predict heart disease risk. It doesn't. It's the lipoproteins. And these are lipoproteins that you need to worry about. So atherogenic dyslipidemia, as I will show you convincingly, is that the association of hyperinsulinemia, in other words, too much insulin, which is a characteristic of type 2 diabetes, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, and increased number of small LDL cholesterol particles. And these are the damaging ones that get into the arteries and damage them. And then there's another component which is not important. So when you're looking for people at risk of heart disease, you look at that for that combination. And that combination is predictive insulin resistance. The more insulin resistant you are, the worse this is. And what we've learned in the last month, that's how up to date we are, in the last month, is that the hyperinsulin, sorry, the hydroglycerides, low HDL, and increased number of small LDL particles are directly related to the amount of fat in the liver. So this is a disease of fatty liver that causes the atherogenic dyslipidemia in people who are insulin resistant eating a high carbohydrate diet. So a month ago, I couldn't have put it all together, but I can tell you today, that is the future of understanding this disease. And the irony is, we're not going to learn how to prevent heart disease working with cardiologists. We're going to learn it working with liver specialists to understand what is a fatty liver. So, 
That, now, now, what do we do in medicine? We treat each of these diseases as separate conditions. And my argument is that they are not. They are the same condition. And you have to treat them all with the same intervention. And what we're doing today is we're not optimizing management of these conditions by putting them in separate silos and thinking we can make a difference. We can't. Because the underlying cause of the problem is insulin resistance. That is the disease. These are merely symptoms of an underlying disease, which is called insulin resistance, or an underlying condition. And this, in fact, is not even a condition. It's a normal biological condition that is made abnormal by a high carbohydrate diet. So, if you're carbohydrate tolerant, if you're fortunate to be carbohydrate tolerant, I would argue 20% of the population are probably carbohydrate tolerant in South Africa. Different population will be different. You're insulin sensitive, you're probably athletic, and you probably have a normal body weight. And we all sit somewhere on this curve. Normal, highly carbohydrate tolerant, or like myself, profoundly carbohydrate intolerant, like my father. And we are insulin resistant. And the characteristics of insulin resistance are with age, your waistline expands, you become obese, you develop metabolic syndrome, and you develop type 2 diabetes. And that is the only way you can go if you continue to eat a high carbohydrate diet if you're insulin resistant. And I will argue that the type 2 diabetes explosion that we are seeing is because we are exposing insulin resistant populations to increasing carbohydrate intakes. And I will go further to say that I believe in time that cancer and dementia will also be linked to this condition, that they are both also diseases of insulin resistance. It's, the evidence for dementia is pretty close because in dementia the brain becomes insulin resistant. We call it type 3 diabetes. And the brain now can only burn ketone bodies, as I emphasize, in the de demented patient. They need more high-fat diets to provide ketone bodies for the, for the brain to function. And we'll talk about cancer in due course as well.